It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague on the commission and our keynote speaker, Dr. Kenya Beard, the commission representative from National League for Nursing. Dr. Beard is the associate provost for Chamberlain University and a 2012 Macy faculty scholar. She is a diversity science expert who has propagated research to strengthen diversity in nursing. Her equity workshops have been facilitated by the National League for Nursing and the Harvard Macy Institute Program for Educators in Health Professions. She serves on the New York State Board for Nursing and the Editorial Board for the American Journal of Nursing. Let us welcome Dr. Kenya Burt. Thank you, Dr. Garcia Dia. And thank you all for joining today's summit. While you can see me, what you might not readily see are all the individuals who came before me and informed much of my work. The work of Dr. Sally Tucker Allen, Dr. Darlene Clark Hine, Beverly Malone, Janice Brewington, Roberta Waite, Renita Julian, Dina Hassana, Virginia Adams, Rumay Alexander, Frida Outlaw, Deborah Barksdale, and so many more. Their light has positioned us to continue to endure and make greater progress. Thank you again for joining today's summit. I am so excited that the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing has convened this critical event where we can address and strategically co-create bold processes that bring us closer to dismantling racism and fulfilling the ideals of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Lawyers are told, <clears throat> never ask a question, never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. You don't want the witness to surprise you. But the commission did not listen to those in instructions. In 2021, the commission audaciously asked the question, does racism exist in nursing? And Dr. Grant shared that he and his colleagues braced themselves for the findings. Well, what did they find? As I advance this slide, excuse me, as I get used to the new technology and I could advance remotely, if it's working, yes. So when you look at these statements, what do you think the commission found? Enter in the chat which one of these statements you believe are true. Were there more than 5,000 responses? More than half reported that they personally experienced an act of racism in the workplace? Did nearly half report widespread racism in nursing? And did over half share that their efforts to challenge racist treatment resulted in no change? Many of you have selected all. And regrettably, each statement is true. However, we must look at the outcomes from a place of wisdom and hope rather than despair and dejection. For wisdom and hope will embolden us to shift away from systemic racism and co-create a discipline that is empowered to take down racism. Proverb 2414 says, know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there's a future hope for you. So wisdom is key. So how do we define racism? Dr. Rumay Alexander led us in this definition and the commission came up with these words. The assaults, plural, on the human spirit in the form of actions, biases, prejudices, and an ideology of superiority based on race that persistently cause moral suffering and physical harm of individuals and perpetuates systemic injustices and inequities. But we're here today to talk about systemic racism. So a nurse 
who identifies as black worked at a facility where she was racially berated. She was called the N-word. She was repeatedly subjected to racial slurs by patients. She was even told to go back to Africa. She reported the behavior to her manager and her supervisor, but she was told there's nothing they can do because the patient has the right to say whatever they want to say. Now you could probably see the interpersonal example of racism in that scenario, but where is the systemic piece? Systemic and structural racism are forms of racism that are pervasive, deeply embedded in and throughout our system, laws, written or unwritten policies, sorry, there's nothing I can do, entrenched practices, sorry, the patient can say what they want, established beliefs and attitudes that produce, condone, and perpetuate widespread unfair treatment to people of color. There's nothing we can do, claimed the manager. Well, these managers didn't know Dr. Dawson because Dr. Dawson stated in a press release earlier this year that structural and systemic practices that allow the racist behaviors of leaders to continue to go unaddressed must be dismantled. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. So when we consider systemic racism, and sorry, I forgot to advance, I'm talking and talking, excuse me. When we consider systemic racism. What are the unwritten policies, the entrenched practices, the established beliefs, the, the attitudes that allowed this nurse who identifies as Black to be berated? What are those practices? Do we teach students in nursing school how to address this when they graduate? Where were the allies? How is it that the managers did not know? But two months ago, the EEOC said, enough. When you maintain a racially and hostile work environment, you are violating Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits employers from discriminating against employees on the basis of race. And now that matter is in the hands of the EEOC and this institution is being dragged through the mud. And for what? We did not become nurses to end up on Dateline to be told that we are racist or, or to be subjected to racist practices. We are a profession of caring individuals. So how is this happening? We have laws to protect against discrimination and yet it continues. So what exactly are we missing? How is it that some people don't even recognize racist acts? When you look at this next image, I want you to tell me, what is it that you see? Put in the chat box, what do you see? Someone said they see an open field, a mountain pasture, peace, open land, an opportunity, a farm. Good. God's creation, a meadow, a blurry image. Now, how is it that individuals, all of us can see the same picture, yet we're all seeing different things? Notice how you can miss things when you are far away from something or it's removed from your field of vision. Perhaps you have little experience with something or it hits your blind spot. For sure, it is hard to act on what one cannot see. But notice when it comes to racism, some people have a lens that provides a sharper acuity, which allows them to readily see and call out violations. But where do those call outs land? 
Racism is not always explicit, like the example I shared earlier. Sometimes we have to make space for people to share what they see. Isabel Wilkinson, the author of Cast, a New York Times bestseller, she shared that racism goes about its work in silence, the string of a puppet master unseen by those whose subconscious it directs. Its instructions, an intravenous drip to the mind, cast in the guise of normalcy. Injustice looking just, atrocities looking unavoidable, to keep the machinery humming. What machinery is she talking about? That machinery is systemic racism. The systems of our society might be framed in silos, but to what extent do these systems work collectively to undermine nursing's determination to operationalize our value for social justice? How do the systems work together to undermine access to and the quality of healthcare and nursing education? Again, we have siloed these systems. But I shared once, if you had to move into a house that was boarded up and condemned and every room was rotten, but I said, you get to go in and clean up one room, would you wanna go? How was going into one room of that house fixing the issue? Just because the living room might be fixed up, what about the kitchen and the bathroom and where you're sleeping? All of those rooms are impacted. Whether there's no plumbing, no electricity. So when we think about society, the systemic, the systems that we see, our educational system, for instance, how does K through 12 preparation impact a student's ability to meet admission criteria for nursing school? To what extent does nursing admission criteria perpetuate a, a majority workforce that has shown very little movement with diversity? When we look at our housing, in what ways does redlining impact who gets access to a high quality of education. Two years ago, where I live, Long Island, New York, there was a scathing report about redlining and how, although it's no longer legal to segregate, it is done by de facto. They put wires on, on homeowners and cameras and they allow them to go to these different home places to, to purchase a home. And the, the individuals were caught on camera saying, oh no, you don't wanna to move to this neighborhood. No, you wanna move over here. But when it was a, a person from a minoritized group, oh yeah, you, this is a great area for you. Yeah, yeah, the school district is, is improving. You, you wanna move here and the racial steering persisted. How is that possible? Because we know the impact of redlining. And when we think about employment, what hiring practice, practices or expectations exclude a racially and ethnically diverse pool of candidates? To what extent does your leadership team reflect the customers you serve? Sometimes we put out ads for faculty or for deans and it's coded. We'll say we want someone from a research intensive institution that's only, you know, has done NIH grants. Who are those individuals? Who makes up the majority? We know we have issues regarding NIH funding and who gets funded and who doesn't. We also know that not too long ago, 
pre-George Floyd, it wasn't sexy to do research on diversity. In fact, some of us on this call were told, you're not gonna get tenure doing research based on diversity, equity, and inclusion. How is that research? Regarding the criminal justice system, in what ways are groups denied opportunities when opioid abuse is criminalized for some and empathized for others? And when we talk about healthcare, every year, ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they remind us that if you're from a minoritized group or if you are poor, you are likely to have worse outcomes. How is that possible? When each and every one of us that has RN behind our name will attest to the fact that we wake up every day determined to deliver high quality care. What gets in the way? These system work together to undermine our efforts. So what exactly can we do? Well, the CDC, let me try to advance the slide again. We know that the CDC has a Hear Her camp, uh, campaign. And why do they have this Hear Her campaign? Well, maternal, maternal mortality is alarming in this country. And the CDC is saying, we need to listen to what our patients are saying and not just listen, have the humility to respond to the needs of mothers. Too often, the voices of some patients evaporate inside a system that fails to recognize the ways in which it contributes to poor outcomes. What are we doing about it? Besides listening, how are we, how are we recognizing the ways in which racism enters institutions? How do we recognize that? So we have to realize in this country, many of us, I could say none of us were here when our country was built on racist practices. So there's no need to shame anyone or blame anyone because we all know how we can be conditioned in a society not to recognize something. And while today we might be talking about racism, each and every one of us on this call, if you live long enough, you've missed something, unless you're perfect. And if you are, you need to write a book about it. It'll be a bestseller. When we miss things in healthcare, people are harmed. And the inheritance are the policies that exist. The fact that we can have in 2022 and 2021 leaders who dismiss complaints of racism. So when we think about our policies, what are our recruitment policies? How, do, how does our recruitment policy serve as a filter to prevent an inclusive environment? And when we think about our hiring policies, what is it about the ways in which we hire individuals? Now, I understand, I have a friend who's an HR exec and she'll say, Kenya, we look for three things. Can they do the job? Will they do the job? And are they a good fit? What? How are we still asking that subjective question? Are they a good fit? A good fit according to what? As nurses, we exist in an evidence-based society, evidence-based practice. How dare we still Talk about good fit. Because too many times, good fit is code for, I don't want to change. I like the system that we have. I don't want to be inclusive. 
When we think about faculty assignments, the study that I did with Dr. Julian, we had some nurses saying that they, they had all the credentials, but they weren't given the position. And people who didn't have the credentials were put in their place. There was a nurse who said, an educator, who said she was the only nurse practitioner credentialed. And she was told to teach in the undergraduate program where someone who did not have NP behind their name taught the NP course. How is that possible? So when we think about evaluations, are evaluations a surprise? No one should be surprised by their evaluations. And yet, when we have these calls, we still hear people saying the injustices, how things are used against them. When we look at tenure and promotion, does the benchmark change? Is there transparency? And what about the practices? What do we do with an interview process? How do we respond to charges of racism? If no one in your institution has talked about racism, as a leader, you have to try to understand why that is. Because in 2022, every leader should be having this conversation. To what extent do you believe racism exists? When you look at the policies, what are the practices that we might be perpetuating the results that we say we want to change, but yet we continue to see? When we admit students, is it a holistic admission or are we still trying to hold on to the quantitative scores to determine whether or not someone is going to be successful in nursing? Are we still having the conversation about getting rid of associate degree programs? I love to ask when I'm in a room full of nurses, especially nurse leaders, well, all the leaders who started with an associate degree, please stand up. It's usually half the room. So when you say get rid of associate degree nurses, what you're saying is to get rid of the leaders like us. How do we work with these individuals? At the Academy last week, I shared a story because that issue of getting rid of the associate degree program came up again. And I shared how in 1956, this horrific accident occurred. TWA and United Airlines, somehow their flight path got crossed and both planes collided in midair. This collision resulted in one plane going straight down. Can you imagine 3000 feet in the sky plummeting because your tail is off but you're in that plane screaming, going down, crashing to the bottom. And then the other plane crashing into the wall. Well, not all of us were here in 56, but let me tell you, the public demanded answers. They wanted to blame someone. Some of them said, blame the pilot. It's probably the pilots, they didn't have enough experience. Maybe they came from an associate degree program. No, they didn't say that. Some of them were saying, well, maybe, maybe these pilots weren't trained in the military during wartime. They make the better pilots. Some people were saying, not the pilots, air traffic control, blame them. But the aviation system, the industry, they knew they had to get it right because our country was watching them. And they did due diligence and they worked their butts off. And you know what they realized? It wasn't the pilot, it wasn't the air traffic controller, 
It was an inadequate system. Is healthcare an inadequate system? Last I checked, the answer was yes. When do we move away from blaming individuals and creating a curriculum that not only allows students to have the competencies that will allow them to pass the NCLEX, but to be able to go and practice in a setting free from racism that according to Maslow, allows them to achieve their highest height. That's self-actualization. Because all of us on this call know that you can't achieve self-actualization if you don't have belonging. And why does that seem like it's the biggest kept secret? You want people to be their best? We have to create a system that allows everyone in the system to feel that sense of belonging. So in what ways could policies and procedures sustain racialized outcomes? We're gonna talk about that later today. And when we think about practices, to what extent have you addressed policies and practices that perpetuate systemic racism? None of us are excused. Whether you don't talk about it because it's too difficult, you don't talk about it because that's not who you are, whether you talk about it and you do it in a way that makes everybody run for the hills sometimes, oops, sorry, but whatever it is, if we don't create a sense of belonging for each and every one of us to be able to use our voice in a way that moves us forward, patients' lives are at stake. And our job is to save lives. So what are we doing to prevent that? So I wanna share one thing before I end. Enough of the individuals do this, do that. We know it's the system and we need to approach this from a systems level. Each and every one of us have to come together and assess the inequities and invite different perspectives. We need to analyze the extent to which systemic racism is fueling current inequities. Be brave, be daring. We need to determine where conversations will take place, whether it's faculty meetings, whether it's your, your meetings that you have on the nursing unit, where is that place? If you end this year and you, you and your institution have not identified a place for a conversation about racism, then you have to just face the fact that you are perpetuating the problem. We have to provide actionable steps to align policies and practices with institutional values. That institution where that nurse was at, where she was berated for, for many months, that institution said they value diversity, equity, and inclusivity. We can value something and then on the other hand, practice in a way that does not align with our value. Tell me who on this call always aligns their practices with their values. Who, who are you? Who's that individual? We are all human, we all make mistakes. So no, you don't and it's okay. It's okay because we're going to give each other grace to get this right. Because our patients' lives depend on it. We must be intentional about consequences. Now the consequences for these managers, someone should have intervened earlier. We must make sure we don't blame individuals we blame the systems that allow these behaviors to continue. The individuals alert us to the problem. These managers and supervisors for that institution, they showed us weaknesses 
leaks in the system, leaks in a curriculum that graduated leaders that didn't know how to deal with racism, that didn't even know that the EEOC would be breathing down their necks. FedEx was just sued $350 million for a Civil Rights Act violation. Are you kidding me? How is it happening in 2022? Well, when you're not intentional, it can happen. So when we violate our policies and practices that seek to build community, there has to be a consequence. And we need to evaluate the, effect, the effectiveness and revise things as needed. Next year, we all need to come back here, same date, same time, different year, and talk about. And, and did you notice, by the way, I used ADPI, assess, analyze, determine, intentional with implementations and evaluate. So hopefully it makes it easier for us to remember the obstacle is the path. And that proverb says you can't go to the side of it. You can't ignore the elephant in the room. If we want to create a system where diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging occurs, the obstacle is the path. Racism, we have to go through it. We have to knock it down. You can't go over it, can't go under it, can't go around it. We have tried the definition of insanity. Keep doing it. That $350 million lawsuit against FedEx that they're trying to appeal could be your institution. For what? Racism is alive and well in this, in this country. And we as nurses, 4 million strong, we have the power, if not for the rest of the system, to start cleaning up the first room and allow the rest of the rooms to follow suit. We can do it because we're nurses. Thank you again. Thank you so much for joining. Let me advance the slide and allow Marcus to come back in. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. 10,000 times thank you, Dr. Beard. I always enjoy hearing you and I often quote you in my own talks about this and how you challenge us to examine to the extent to which racism is operating in various spaces and places. So, so we thank you so much. My name is Marcus Henderson and I am a commission representative from the ANA Board of Directors. Um, so now we have about 10 minutes. Uh, if anyone has questions for Dr. Beard and if you wish to speak, we encourage you to uh, please use the raise your hand feature to speak and then unmute your microphone when you are called upon. You can also place comments and questions in the chat as well. So I would encourage folks to please raise your hand and uh, ask questions of our phenomenal keynote speaker while, while we have her here. And you're getting many thank yous and, and, and uh, thank you for the powerful message presentation in the chat. Great. Jasmine, I invite you to come off mute and ask your question. <laughs> Hello, um, thank you so much for this talk. This has been amazing. Um, so um, I serve in uh, clinical workforce development and also as a clinical instructor. What do you recommend um, for ways of how we can implement um, just talking about racism with our students at the clinical sites and just incorporating that in um, group, you know, group talk? post-clinical. Mm. So great question. Thank you, Jasmine. So when we take students out clinically, I believe your question is how do we broach this subject and talk about racism? I, I think we need to start from a place of authenticity and start with the facts, always with the facts, healthcare disparities and why they exist and allow the students to have an opportunity to do the research because something that happens when you ask me to find out why healthcare disparities exist, something is gonna open up in my brain. And when I read the information, to be able to wrestle with it, come back into the learning environment and have a conversation about it. What does this mean to you? 
Who has seen this? How do we perpetuate it? And try to come from a place where we're genuinely concerned, yes, dismayed by healthcare disparities, but how do we empower the next generation to go out into clinical settings and to be able to do something about it? Don't try to go it alone. We need to know from that institution where you're going to bring the students, what are they doing to address healthcare disparities? How can some of those leaders come in and speak to your students? Your institution, if you have a diversity officer, bring that diversity officer in. We have been conditioned in nursing to be like this echo chamber where if you're not a nurse, I'm not listening to you. There are so many brilliant people out there other than nurses. Yeah, believe it or not, that can help inform what we're doing. So invite those voices in. I hope I answered your question. You absolutely did. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Canty. Hi, good evening. Good evening. I, I just have this question. It's something that I've been struggling with. And I know that the system is flawed. But what do we do for those who use the system? Like they know the system works against people of color and they use it and they get away with it. So what do we, like, how do we handle those um, situations? And I'm really thinking about like, just to give an example, a student in a nursing program and they change policies and procedures to kick that student out. And it's very evident and they, there's no accountability, but they know they use these policies and procedures to say, well, this is why we did it. So I just want to know, like, what, how can we address that? Great question. So three things, and, and I hope you don't get me into trouble, Dr. Canty, but good trouble is always good. Number one. I love good trouble. <laughs> number one, if there's a student who feels that they've been discriminated against, they need to know who and where in their institution they are supposed to go. There needs to be a process in place and we have to trust that the process will work. That's number one. If the process fails the student, I am looking at external institutions to do, to lead the way. Students should not have to feel that they are on their own. Where are all these organizations? NBNA. NLN, ANA, what are the structures that they have in place to help create the conditions that are needed? And no, not every organization could be the be all end all, but we've got to think strategically. We know where the leaks are. Your example is an, is an example of a leak in the system. Who is checking that? We know for the nurses who went to their leaders in that facility and said patients were saying X, Y, Z, we can see that the system failed that nurse. She went to the EEOC and now it's being addressed. But we don't wanna have to go outside of the system, the institution. Every institution should have a process in place to remedy this. But until we get there, we need to have a plan B. And the plan B needs to be some of our organizations external to us, helping us, gently guiding us to a path called DEI and belonging. Great question. Great, great question. Thank you. Good trouble. Thank you. Yes, always good trouble. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jessica. Hello, good evening. Um, my question has to do, again, with trying to eliminate uh, racism in regards to uh, ed student admissions. So I live in an area where 30% um, of our population is at or below the poverty level. A significant portion of that population is Black or African American. Um, so obviously, this is a population I want to draw my students from. I need to see my, my clinical practice reflected in my student and my leadership body. So how do we try to eliminate when we're talking about 
um, using data points to drive admissions and do that with eliminating racism? Great question. So what are we currently doing? In nursing, we're re recommending holistic admissions. But holistic admissions is not a panacea. When students come in, we sometimes create barriers, unnecessary barriers, that creates this revolving door. So yes, to your point, make sure we have holistic admissions, but make sure we also have the resources, not just for students, because for some reason, and I don't know why, but again, this is good trouble, students aren't the only issue. What about faculty who don't know how to teach diverse in a diverse setting? Or faculty who might say things that create an environment where students don't feel like they belong. Again, Maslow, how am I acing my exams if I feel threatened, if I don't feel like I belong? There are multiple reasons why students are not successful. And sometimes the easiest target is the student. Well, they weren't cut out for nursing. Check your curriculum. Check to make sure your faculty are prepared and not just prepared to teach content, prepared to dismantle racism, to talk about healthcare disparities and to ensure that we graduate future providers who when a patient says the N-word, we don't turn around and say, there's nothing I can do. They have the right to say that. Thank you for your question. All right, thank you. So Peter, you are going to be our last question. So we have about three minutes for your question and the answer, and then we're gonna move on to our breakout sessions. So Peter. Great, thank you. Um, and first, full disclosure, um, let me say that Dr. Beard is actually my boss, and I am not a plant in the audience of somebody who um, was planted to ask a question. I, I find the, the topic very interesting and something that we talk about uh, oftentimes um, in our daily work. But I have a quick question. Um, you know, in the Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030 report, um, it was stated that faculty really struggle. They want to be, employ diversity and inclusion in their classroom, but they struggle with moving from intent to action. What do you think is one of the best ways, and, and this is actually a quote from your research, so what are some of the best ways you think we can help faculty move from intent to action in the classroom? Oh, and and no. before you start there, could we get the music cut out, please? Because some of it's cutting in and out uh, for the, thank you so much. Thank you. And Dr. Kupalara, thank you for that question. How do we better prepare faculty to engage in these bold conversations? I'm very fortunate to be working at Chamberlain University with the president, Karen Cox, who wants to have these conversations, who hired me to make sure we are having these conversations. And to be able to have people on my team, like Dr. Kupalara, who actually is a faculty development specialist who goes into the classroom and helps. I guess that's, that means it's our time, but basically to help faculty to do exactly what he's talking about, to create learning environments that, unfortunately, it's hard to talk about racism, but to give the faculty the, the words that they need to find their voice in this setting. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kupalara, and thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions and comments throughout the chat. Um, and again, uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Beard for her phenomenal keynote presentation. Uh, so now uh, we are going